Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Man, I'm uh, with uh, Brother Yates. I really enjoy fall. Really, any time where it's okay to wear flannel on purpose, uh, I'm game for that. Uh, my name is Zach George. I'm the worship and uh, outreach minister here at Westside. If you don't know me, I'm not normally the one who preaches, uh, but, you know, Tim's out of town, so you get me. So I'm thankful for the opportunity for, uh, to speak to, to you guys while he's away. Uh, I just want to say special thanks to Chase and uh, him... Uh, his growth as a worship leader and the fact that he's willing to let me corrupt him for a few months. So if you guys uh, don't, don't know him, get to know him, maybe take him out to lunch or something. Ayo. Uh, he's a good guy and uh, he'll, he'll be with us just uh, for a little bit longer this, this year. So we've been in this, this series we're calling Kingdom Mind, which is kind of a deep dive uh, into Romans chapter 12. Romans is my favorite book probably in the whole Bible, but especially in the New Testament. Uh, but uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've really enjoyed this series. I've really been kind of hanging on every week um, and thankful to Tim for the practical ways that he's really showed us on how we can allow God uh, to change our mind to a kingdom mind. I'm thankful uh, for his expertise as a counselor and uh, the experience that he has when it comes to that. I'm not going to get in the old thought box today. Uh, that's not really my thing. That's more of Tim's thing. Also, I'm just a tad bit claustrophobic, so... Uh, you ain't going to get me in there. But uh, what I do want to do is kind of take this time as we start to uh, go back to the top of Romans chapter 12 and kind of refocus our mind on, uh, on why we're talking about this, on, on what we're talking about here. So if you turn, uh, got your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to read the first two verses. Um, now, probably a lot of you have this memorized already. Uh, even before we started this series. It's a very popular uh, and powerful passage of Scripture, but uh, I, I, I think it can't hurt to sort of refresh our memories, kind of reframe our minds, especially if, uh, before we dive into exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we focused this basically entire series uh, for several weeks now on this idea of a transformed mind, allowing God to transform us to a kingdom mindset, which leads us to believe that that's very different than a normal human mindset, right? The kingdom mind and the human mind are, are two different things. And in fact, a lot of the things that we've talked about so far feel very unnatural to us. A lot of the practical things that Tim has taught us so far, they just feel like maybe that just, ugh, like it doesn't feel uh, uh, natural to us. And, and, and things like loving people but hating sin, that's hard for us sometimes, it's hard for us to separate those two. Being patient in affliction and joyful in hope doesn't necessarily always come naturally to us. Keeping our spiritual fervor, thinking about ourselves with sober judgment, these things feel very unnatural to us, and that's because they are. Because to have a kingdom mind is to live by the Spirit, but living by the flesh is what comes to us more naturally you see, verse 1 that we just read already tells us that the kingdom mind, the kingdom life, is going to be very hard to accomplish. It says we have to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. That's hard to do. Worship is self-sacrifice, not just on Sunday, but every day. It's an everyday changing of our mind, changing the way we think about everyday actions, interactions, and relationships. You with me so far? All right, so today, today what we're going to talk about specifically is how do we have a kingdom mind, specifically when it comes to people who ask us for help. When people come to us and they seek our help, how do we have a kingdom mind and perspective as we do that? So if you'll uh, skip down a few verses, uh, we're going to start in chapter 9, we're going to read, or no, chapter 12 and verse 9, and we're going to read uh, through verse 16. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep 
your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. <clears throat> when it comes to sharing with those in need, as verse 13 says, uh, especially for churches, there are many different schools of thought and practices on how to do this. When it comes to sharing with those in need. I'm going to uh, tell you how I think this goes, just kind of give you a synopsis on how churches uh, share with those in need. But before I do that, I'll say to you that some of you will agree with this, and some of you won't agree with this. Some of you will be surprised to hear this, and some of you won't be surprised to hear this, and some of you will reject it outright. But I'm preaching today, so you got to listen to my synopsis here. So when it comes to sharing with those in need, it basically goes something like this. A person comes to us with a need, it's usually a physical or material request. Uh, they come to us with a need, and, and we see that that request gets to the person uh, who, can, who can meet that request. For years here, it was Frank Foster. Uh, he, you know, made himself gray doing this stuff for people. I know Joe Russell was very involved in doing that for many years, too, and a lot of you have been. So someone comes to us with a need, usually a physical need, and we see that that gets to whoever can do it. Or we take it on ourselves. And usually what that means is we give the person everything they ask for. Generally, they come in with something and we say, well, we're going to meet that need. And uh, we feel good about it, they feel good about it, and they leave and some time passes. Well, some time passes and they come back again, right? And they've got either a different need or the same need, but it's the same person. And, and this time we talk it over a little bit, we think a little bit, and then, you know, we, we just go ahead and meet that need again. They feel good about it, we feel less good about it this time. Some time passes, they leave, and what do you know? Wash, rinse, and repeat, they come back, right? They come back. Jennifer, you know what I'm talking about? You've been there? Okay. Uh, Jennifer works in our office, and she sees this kind of stuff all the time. So somebody comes back, and, and here they have the same need over and over again. Finally, this time, we say, enough is enough. Uh, you've met the limit. Uh, we have budget cuts. Whatever it is, uh, we can't do it anymore. And what happens? They get mad at us, right? Usually they go around tell, I'm telling people that we wouldn't help them at all, and then we get mad, and everybody's mad, right? And that's basically a summary of church benevolence around the United States. It's frustrating. You know, rarely is there any life change in this scenario. Rarely is there any relationship built. Rarely is there anything other than the exchange of some material things or some monetary funds. You see, in this scenario, we see a problem, and we fix a problem. More accurately, we see a symptom, and we fix a symptom. The problem isn't really even addressed. But worst of all, the worst thing that happens is that an us and them scenario is created. A dividing wall is built that says, we are the helpler, and you are the helpless. We are the fixer, and you are the object that needs to be fixed. We build a wall between those that we mean to help. In Celebrate Recovery, we have a saying, and we say it every week because we believe it. We are here to support one another, not fix. We're here to support each other, not fix each other. You see, a fixer looks at what can be immediately taken care of quickly and efficiently. And when you become a fixer, when I become a fixer, it becomes about, look what I did. Look how quickly we helped. Look how quickly we fixed the problem. Problem solved. But the problem is, is that we as people do not have the capacity to fix each other. Also, objects are meant to be fixed, but people aren't. You see, when you fix something, you can do it without seeing the inherent value in it. It's broken. It just needs fixing. But support, support is a whole different story. Support requires sacrifice on our part. Remember back to the first part of Romans, living sacrifice. Support requires sacrifice on our part. A lot of times, especially in, in churches, what we think of when it comes to sacrifice is money. We think about tangible, physical things that we can sacrifice. Sometimes it's our time, but most of the time, it isn't money. But I got to say, for most of us, money isn't really a sacrifice. Most of the time, giving money doesn't really cost us that much. 
And, and a lot of times what we end up doing is throwing money at these problems so that we don't have to get messy. Money is easy. It's just a lot easier for when someone has a problem to go, hey, here's 20 bucks, please go away and don't get your dirt on me, okay? Money is easy and it leaves us feeling fulfilled. But let me ask you this. When you read Romans chapter 12 in verse 1 and it says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, does that sound like something that's supposed to be easy? To be a living sacrifice, does that sound like something that's supposed to leave you feeling good and fulfilled and fluffy? It's not supposed to be easy. You know, I hear people say all the time, uh, if I had more, I would do more. If I had more money, if I had more time, if I had more experience, if I had more education, if I had more, I would do more. Let me put this in the most uh, eloquent Yale County way I know how to. That's baloney, okay? It's just uh, hogwash, as we say, over across the bridge. If I had more, I would do more. Firstly, it's been my experience that that just isn't true. If you ain't doing it now, you ain't going to do it when you have more. All right? Secondly, can I use ain't in here? Is that okay? <laughs> Secondly, uh, money, resources aren't going to fix the problem. And we're going to get into that a little more later. But lastly, and this is the most important thing, is that what we have doesn't determine what God can do. What we have doesn't determine what God can do. And if you don't believe me when I say it, believe the Bible. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says that his power is made perfect in our weaknesses, not in our strengths. But here we go, throwing money, throwing resources at the problem. You know, charitable giving in this country today and around the world is up higher than it's ever been. Almost everyone, including the material poor, give to charity Charities are not hurting for money. We've turned helping into big business by simply throwing money at problems and then wondering why it hasn't helped. And that's because money is not the solution. Believe it or not, more times than not, money causes more problems than it fixes. I believe it was a 90s hip-hop artist that said, mo' money, mo' problems, okay? Uh, but this is true when it comes to charitable giving. More times than not, money causes more problems than it fixes. But why? Why isn't money the solution? Because the problems that people face are not physical. They're not only physical problems. They're social problems. They're psychological problems. And they are spiritual problems. And this is especially true of the material poor. You see what happens when you just throw money at people is you don't see the whole person. You're fixing one part of the whole person, or you're trying to take care of one part, just the physical. You're not worried about the social, the psychological, or the spiritual. You're not taking care of the whole person, just a symptom. If you're interested in this subject, I'd like to reference to you uh, two books right now. The first one is called Toxic Charity. It's by a guy named Robert Lupton. He's the founder of the uh, Focus Community, Community Strategies Urban Ministries. Uh, he also has a center called the Lupton Center, which I got to train for uh, a year under. And it basically just kind of, they're working in downtown Atlanta right now, trying to find ways to develop community, to, for communities to develop. And the second book is called uh, When Helping Hurts. It's by Steve Corbett and Brian Fickert, I think is how I'm saying his name today. Uh, but both of these books highlight problems that are caused often around the world through charitable giving. I'm gonna read you a quote from When Helping Hurts. If we reduce human beings to simply physical, as Western thought is prone to do, our poverty alleviations will tend to focus on material solutions. But if we remember that humans are spiritual, social, psychological, and physical beings, our poverty alleviation efforts will be more holistic in their design and in their execution. We've got to stop reducing people, flesh and blood, human beings, to simply being physical. That's not the whole person. We must also realize that everyone was created in the image of God, and there is so much more to us than just our physical being. And only when we begin to change the way that we think about people can we truly begin to help them. Now, just an aside here, I'm not telling you not to give to charity, okay? Don't hear me saying uh, that, that you shouldn't give to charity. Just don't let that be all that you do. And when you do give to charity, make sure the charity is rooted in seeing the whole person, building relationships, not just solving 
physical problems. There are great organizations like the Red Cross that do emergency things. Those are great organizations to give to you. But make sure when you give to organizations that, that they're rooted in relationship building. You know, the reason that we started this series, it wasn't just about good advice on how to navigate life. It was about how we can allow God to renew our minds to a kingdom perspective, to a different perspective than what we've traditionally thought about. The old mind, the human mind, the flesh mind would say, I need to fix this project. This person is my project. I need to fix them. The old mind would say, I'm just going to throw money at this problem because that's easy and that's what I got, so I'm going to do it. The old mind would say, I don't have time to fix this mess or get involved. The old mind would say, I don't want to be around messy people. But the new mind, the renewed mind, the kingdom mind, like in Romans 12, 16 says, is that I am willing to associate with someone of a lower position than me. I am willing to associate with someone of a lower status than me. Now, some of you are just squirming in your chairs because we like to pretend that status doesn't exist. We like to think, well, we're colorblind or we're socially blind. We don't see status. Again, baloney, all right? Uh, We have names for everything. We got Republicans and Democrats and blue collars and white collars and white folks and black folks and rich folks and poor folks. We like to put people in categories. Now, status may not exist in the same way that it existed when Romans was written, but it still exists. And it's not just about money or education. In fact, I know plenty of blue-collar people that think white-collar people are of a lower status than they are, right? Them uppity rich folks and live in Russellville and go to Westside. You know what I'm saying? Uh, That's what I used to say. But now I'm here and I love you. I'm just kidding. Uh, (laughs) But we like to believe and pretend that status doesn't exist, but that's a lie. And we can't be blind to the fact that status exists because to overcome it, we have to be willing to associate with others no matter their status. No matter our status, no matter whose position, we have to be willing to associate with everyone. The new mind, the renewed mind also says, how can I support this person so that they can thrive to be who God made them to be? How can I support someone so that they can be the best version of themselves? I hate to use this analogy, I really do, but uh, because it's probably overused in terms of sermon illustrations, but there's a reason for that. It's uh, the greatest fiction really ever written. So just a show of hands, how many of you have at least uh, seen the movies or read the Tolkien series, Lord of the Rings? All right. Okay, so for those of you that haven't, I'm just going to give you a really quick and tragically undersold synopsis of this story. Basically, you got a bad guy, and he's got a powerful ring, and then you got a bunch of good guys, and they got to destroy the ring. Okay? Pretty, pretty, thank you. So I'll, I'll dive in a little more. We got, we got Frodo. Uh, Frodo is our, our main character. He's our hero. He's an unexpected hero. And his task is to take this ring through evil and treacherous territory, uh, basically to a volcano where the ring was created. And he throws it in and bad guys power destroyed. Okay. If you've not read the series or seen the movies, please don't take this as a great, it's a great story. Okay. Go, go home and watch it. Go home and read it. It really is. Wonderful. But even if you're not familiar with this story, I, I hope you can identify with the point I want to make today. And th- that point is, is that every good story has a hero. In fact, generally, every bad story has a hero as well. But what makes a great story is the supporting cast. What makes a great story are the people that surround our hero. I mean, think about it. Think of your favorite stories or movies. You got your hero, you got your A character, right? Right? And then you have your supporting cast or your B characters. In Lord of the Rings, our B character is this guy, Samwise Gamgee. Or Rudy, as some of you like to call him. Also that guy from Stranger Things. But (laughs) This is Sam. Sam is also an unexpected hero. To the everyday person, viewer, or reader, there's really nothing special about him. He's a little plump around the edges. He loves to eat, drink, and be merry, my kind of guy. And he's really never had an adventure in his life. He isn't especially gifted in one thing. He's not prone to making big speeches. He's not rich. He's not overly capable. He's just a regular, everyday, run-of-the-mill hobbit who lives in a hole in the ground. But the thing that you learn about Sam throughout the story, the thing that stands out about him is that he is a fierce and loyal friend. 
He's always there, right by his friend's side. He's not willing to let Frodo walk through his hard task alone. He's not a great navigator or outdoorsman. He doesn't know anything about how to travel or how to fight. He just knows how to eat potatoes. (laughs) You see, Frodo is burdened by having to carry this ring. It carries with it a great evil, and just by carrying it, it burdens him. And it's a huge burden, especially for someone to do by themselves. Sam can't do it for him. He can't carry the ring. He can't even know what kind of troubles the ring brings, but all he can do is just be there walking with his friend. There's even a time, spoiler alert, sorry, that, uh, but it's, it's nearly 100 years old. Go read it, okay? Uh, there, there's even a time in anger and confusion when the ring convinces Frodo to tell Sam to leave. And he says, get out of here. I want to be by myself. I don't trust you anymore. And what does Sam do? He walks behind him without being noticed, making sure his friend is okay. Until he can come in at a time and fight a big spider. It's really awesome. He gets him out of a real jam. And this is the kind of friend that Sam is. There comes a time in the final part of the story when they can see their destination and they're together on the slopes of Mount Doom, this volcano, and and Frodo just can't do it anymore. He can't walk another inch. The ring and all of the evil has taken over him and he just is sitting there and he can't do anything. And, and Sam is there with him and this is, I think, the most powerful scene in the whole story. Sam, come, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And if you've seen the movie, read the book, you're tearing up right now because it's, I mean, epic music comes in and, and he begins to pick up his friend. He picks him up and he walks him into the volcano. And they, and they finish together. This is why Sam is everyone's favorite character. You see, he can't really know what Frodo is going through, but he realizes that it isn't his load to carry. But he can bear the burden of carrying his friend. He can lift him up and support him and be there when he needs him. Sam is devoted to his friend in brotherly love. And I hope that you have friends like this, you know, especially the next time you got to walk an evil ring through a volcano. But uh, I hope that you have friends like this in your life. And if you don't, then life can be pretty hard. And I imagine that there are many, many people out there that don't have friends like this. The reason I, I tell you this story, the reason I use this illustration is so that we can understand the picture of the type of person and friend that we need to be. Life, unfortunately, is not a movie about us. Life, unfortunately, is not a story where we are the main character. And let me tell you something. If you wake up every day believing that you are the main character in the story of life, you go to bed angry every night. If you believe that life is a story about you, then the fundamental problem with that is so do I, and so does everyone else you encounter. And how does that affect the way that we treat each other? When someone gets that parking space, or someone cuts you off in traffic, they're messing with your storyline. When someone gets that job promotion that you were supposed to get, that's messing with your storyline. I'm the hero in this story, not that guy. Or, or it's making you believe that you are the hero in the story of life and you gotta run around fixing everyone's problems and saving people from despair, which just isn't possible. And you end your day frustrated. But, If you wake up every day and believe that you are the B character, the supporting cast in someone else's story, then your whole day seems different. The first things you ask yourself are, how can I support others on their goals? Not about how I can advance, but how I can help others advance. You see, we are the supporting characters in someone else's story. In our story, Jesus is the hero because he's the only one who really can be. And that's why we frequently find problems and frustration when we try to make ourselves the A character because that's a spot where only Jesus belongs. Uh, I was leading worship at a CCSC retreat a few years ago, a fall retreat, and we had uh, Dr. Nathan Guy came and spoke to us. And uh, he had this quote, and it really always stuck with me. He said, if the gospel is a story about us, then it is not good news. If the gospel is a story about us, 
then it is not good news. The gospel is a story about Jesus, and we are the supporting characters. So how can we make this practical? How can we get down to the nitty-gritty? How can we have a kingdom mind? How can we allow God to change our mind as we support others? If you got notes and you want to take them, if you got something you want to write down, we got four things. So Camden, get to that uh, slide a couple away from that. A kingdom mind supports, not fixes. That's our first point. The kingdom mind supports It doesn't fix. As we've said, as we've been talking about here, people aren't objects. Only objects can be fixed. And there is a huge difference in supporting and fixing. When you're helping others, think of ways you can support them on their goals and dreams, but don't do it for them. Here's a quote from Toxic Charity. When we do for those in need what they have the capacity to do for themselves, we disempower them. When you do for someone in need what they have the power to do for themselves, you take the decision-making ability and power out of their life and you put it in your life. You try to become the hero in someone else's story and you're not there. Support puts the power back where it belongs. Number two, the kingdom mind seeks to be present. You, You can't support people if you aren't around them, if you don't know them. You can't wall yourself off and be the king of your own castle. You have to be in the homes and in the lives of those you want to support. And you can't just throw money at the problem. Simply put, you have to build a relationship with someone in order to help them. As we read in Romans 12 verse 13 said, to practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. So as I say that, as you read that, I just want you to think of what images conjure up in your mind. What does does that mean to you to practice hospitality? If you're like me, you probably think of a time when someone was hospitable to you. When someone practiced hospitality well that you knew. You think about, about that. So let me ask you now, what does hospitality look like? Does it look like giving someone money? Does it look like giving someone a 20 at the at the corner of the stop sign? That's not practicing hospitality. Hospitality is sharing your home with others and them sharing their home with you, sharing life with others, sharing a meal with others, inviting people to be a part of your life and you being a part of theirs, doing life together. That's what hospitality is. The kingdom mind seeks to be present in the lives of those people that we mean to help. Number three, a kingdom mind listens. Listens not to respond but to hear, listens to what isn't being said as well as to what is being said. Again, in order to listen to someone, you have to strive to get to know them. You have to build a relationship. And to really support someone in the way that they need to be supported, you have to look at the whole person, physical, social, psychological, and spiritual. And to know the whole person, you have to listen to them. You have to be around them. You have to get to know them as a whole person. The kingdom mind listens. And the last one, in a kingdom mind, the relationships are mutual. The relationships are mutual. When you treat people like projects, they aren't friends. When someone is an object in need of fixing, they can't be your friend. And it's not a mutual relationship. But when you support people, they can become friends. They can become family. There is give and take. And if those you are supporting aren't also supporting you, then your relationship is not mutual and it can become toxic. In mutual relationships, there is give and take. A one-sided relationship is not a life-giving one. It's not a kingdom relationship. Relationships have to be mutual in the kingdom mind. We have to start thinking about all of this with a kingdom perspective. We can't think about any of this uh, traditionally in the way that we've thought about it. But I do wanna take a second and talk about boundaries. Uh, Some of you maybe have read some books about boundaries. Uh, It seems like in uh, the 90% of the ministry I do when I talk to people is just talking about how to build boundaries. And and let me tell you what that means. So let me give you you an example here. So say that... um, I'm going to use an example that maybe some of you can identify with. (laughs) Uh, Say that someone you're trying to help needs groceries, okay? 
they need to go to the grocery store. Not that you have to buy them groceries, but, but they need to go to the grocery store and feed their family, but they don't have means of travel, right? They don't have a car or a bike or however they can get to the grocery store. And so you decide in, in your, you know, loving way to, to take them to the grocery store so that they can get groceries. Uh, and they call you once a week. Uh, you never know what day. You never know what time. Sometimes twice a week and say, I need to go to the grocery store. And you always take them. You take them, you pick them up, you drop them off at the grocery store. Uh, you come back and pick them up when they're done. Uh, then next week, you, maybe you're scheduled to go to lunch with your spouse or your kids. And they call you at 1145 and say, I need to go to the grocery store. And so you have to cancel lunch. And you go and take them to the grocery store. And you drop them off. And then you guys see where I'm going with this? You never know when they're going to call. You never know when they're going to need to go, but you're just committed to taking them. How long is it going to last before you get infinitely frustrated at this situation? You're going to go, I can't do it anymore. You're going to ignore their calls. You're going to change your number, (laughs) whatever it takes. So this person stops calling you at all hours of the week. You never know when, and, and, and you don't have to take them to the grocery store anymore. All right. First off, let me put your mind at ease on something in this particular scenario, is that no one in Pope County is starving to death, Okay. I can't tell you when the last person starved to death in Pope County. There are people that are food insecure for sure. But if that mind is like, I got to take them right now or they're, they're going to starve, it's just, this is not happening, okay? A good boundary to set in this particular scenario, a good boundary that would help you build relationships is for you to call them and say, hey, I'm going to the grocery store Tuesday at 10 o'clock. I'll be there to pick you up at your house. We will go to the grocery store together. We'll shop together. We'll go down the aisles together. We'll get to know each other. And when we're done, I'll take you home and you can cook me lunch as a thank you, okay? (laughs) Hey, it's all right. If you're helping people, you need to be in their homes. They need to be hospitable to you just as you're hospitable to them. Maybe go get coffee. But during that time, this is a time where you set a boundary that says, when they call you at Thursday at 1145, you can say, nope, we're going Tuesday. Sorry, I got plans. We're going on Tuesday. Does this make sense? They're not starving to death, okay? This says, this is a boundary. That previous one is a fixing relationship that's not mutual. But this is a boundary because a boundary says, I want to support you by helping you support yourself. Having no boundaries is where the fixer lives. Boundaries say, I think you are important, but I also want you to respect my time as well. Mutuality. When we treat people like this, it's respectful. It teaches respect and it shows respect. Hey, I love you, I respect you, but I can't go right now. But I'll be there Tuesday without fail at 10 o'clock to pick you up and we'll go grocery shopping together. Does this make sense to you guys? Now, this is all incredibly complicated. Of course, there are going to be scenarios that are vastly different than, than the one I'm talking about. But I hope you get a picture of the kind of person that we need to be, the kind of support system that we that we need to be. It's incredibly complicated because people are messy, all of us included. We are all messy people. Struggling is the human condition. So I guess to summarize this in all one easy sentence, if you want to write something down, I guess, I guess to summarize all this together, we have to say that we have to be willing to struggle together. We have to be willing to struggle with each other to go through the messes with people and for them to be willing to go through our messes with us. We have to be willing to get to know each other inside and out, to be vulnerable with each other so that we can struggle together. None of us can do life alone. None of us can do life by ourselves. We were meant to have community. We were meant to be in relationship with each other. And so today I wanna say to you, if you're struggling and you're doing it alone, let us struggle together. Let us support you in your life physically, socially, psychologically, but most importantly, spiritually. We were all created in the image of God and all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And you may be here today and think that you don't belong with these good church people here today. First, let me tell you, there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing as good church people. We are all sinners created in the image of God who have fallen short of his glory. And so if you believe that you are one of those good church people, you need to read your Bible, okay? Uh, But if you're here today and you believe that you don't belong here, that's a lie. And let me say this so that it can stick with you, is that you don't have to get righteous to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he makes you righteous. 
because he's the hero of the story. And so today, if you are far from Jesus and you want to make him Lord of your life, master over your life, we have water ready for you to be baptized in his name. If you need prayer today, prayer for healing, prayer for support, prayer for joy, prayer for thanksgiving, there's going to be people around the room in the lobby and in our prayer room ready to receive you in prayer. That prayer can be confidential if you'd like or it can be shared before the church. It's up to you. But let us struggle together as we stand and as we sing.